Hey, everyone. Welcome to Recruiting Trends with Chris Murdoch, the, the podcast uh, for all things connections in recruiting, be it the soft skills in, in recruiting and sourcing, all the way to technology and, and how it helps facilitate connections. So without further ado, I want to introduce Nin Tran uh, from Snap Brilia. Uh, he's going to introduce himself, and then we're going to talk about technology. Hey, guys. My name is Nin, um, the CEO and founder of a new AI and blockchain startup, Snap Brilia. Um, I used to be a, a founding member at Hartual, now Hire Easy, and uh, always, always blessed to be able to partner with recruiters, recruiting leaders, staffing leaders, and companies to make uh, hiring and, and recruiting uh, a little bit easier for everyone. Happy to yeah. be here. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, well, thank you. And you know, it's funny, technology in, rec in the recruiting industry, anyone I, I talk to that's that's new to recruiting tech, and you're, you're not new to recruiting tech, so you're going to be nodding your head here very quickly. Recruiters and sourcers want the easiest like path. They want the technology to create the easiest path from engagement, you know, identification, engagement to hire. So I always joke that recruiters are inherently lazy and we're cheap and we want the technology to do everything for us. And we get really mad when the technology doesn't do everything we think it should. Um, and, and it's rather interesting to see people's faces when I tell them that, that, that you, know, we, you know, we want, we want the technology to make us very efficient. And sometimes, you know, technology has made it, yes, more efficient, but it's taken the personal side away. Right. It's taken some of the, it's, the intent is to remove bias, but oftentimes the technology can insert it, introduce bias. And so walk me through kind of the genesis of, of Snap Brilia, why, you, why you've done this, and, and let's, let's connect these, these dots. Yeah, completely understandable, right? Recruiting is uh, just a lot of work, right? You're finding candidates on LinkedIn using virtual using all kinds of tools and then you reach out to them right or people are applying in droves via job boards and then it's about mm -hmm. kind of sifting through thousands of resumes to find the, the qualified the good candidate that has the right skills can pass all the interviews and and then you get a hire hopefully you get more hires each day right um, but throughout all of that there's like technologies in every corner every step some, Chris, like you mentioned, they, uh, uh, they proliferate, right? The, the already existing bias that's there uh, by, you know, if you're doing, a, if you're already biased, whether you're conscious of it or not, I think everyone is, including myself, right? Uh, doing more of the same, that's something that, that technology will allow you to do. Do more of the same, be more efficient. Uh, Getting get in touch with more candidates in that one hour time time frame, uh, but you know if if let's say your if your hiring process is excluding underrepresented groups already, mm -hmm. uh, and you're still hiring whether you're hiring a hundred or a thousand people, right? Uh, you're still excluding underrepresent group so we started and it may not be intentional Brilliant. and it may not be intentional right right it's absolutely not, yeah. so i'm not blaming yep i just want no i want to i want to make it clear yeah I make it clear. but um you know at the genesis of snap really uh, what i've discovered by talking to a lot of ta leaders and you know, pretty much friends in the space is that they've noticed when they look at the data the larger companies that measure this right in, private mm -hmm. conversations that um, underrepresented groups, especially in tech, there's huge need for more diversity in tech, as you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you know there's like 1.8 million jobs for software engineers in the US alone. Okay. And there's only about 47,000 graduates in computer science degrees every year uh, with about one out of five being gender diverse and one out of seven being being ethnic ethnically diverse. So there's a huge gap for diversity. And when they graduate, now in order to get a computer science job, they have to pass something called a coding assessment. Right. So originally when we started Snap Brilia, I learned that you know if you're underrepresented, you're 50% more likely to fail the coding assessment 
than if you're not. Uh, and that was like shocking. And I wonder why that happens, right? Uh, it's not that people from you know, minority groups, they don't send kids to study computer science degrees. They're there, but oftentimes when they do go to STEM degrees or engineering degrees, they don't always get to the most well-funded schools. And if a school is not well-funded, they may teach you, you know, how to earn your degree, right? But they mm -hmm. don't teach you how to pass a coding test, which is a completely different skill set. It's kind of like how to pass the uh, SAT. Is is that because it's uh, I, in some of the coding tests that I've seen, it, it tends to be, you know, the theory. Is it because they're going to schools that are teaching how to code versus the theory of coding? What's the what's the what's the difference? Yeah, the, the difference is, um, you know, the, the it, it is it's mostly databases, algorithms, system design, uh, which you know, like a regular software engineer doesn't even see on a on a daily basis, unless you're doing some scientific work, like more theory mm -hmm. work, you don't see that. So it's not applicable. But however, because everyone wants to be a software engineer, you have, you have 20 million people who essentially quit their job in the last six months, right, the great resignation. Mm -hmm. And there's 400 million people that will quit their jobs in the next eight years, right? You have people, you know, working in retail and the shop's not doing well. They're not doing anything. Sometimes they get laid off. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they go home. They can't go out because COVID or don't want to go out, right? And so what they do, they have, they have the internet and they go online and they either start to go to a boot camp, pay 10 to 50 grand to, you know, learn, learn hands-on skills or enroll in a CS degree, which will take a little bit longer, right? There's some accelerated yeah. programs, but uh, ultimately, you know, there's a there's a millions and millions of people that, that are learning skills, hands-on skills, and now they wanna get a job in tech. And all of them, hey, pass this coding test and never seen a coding test. I had friends who are African-American, you know, in his, uh, and he, he had a PhD in math from MIT, actually. And uh, when he wanted to get into data science, when he started, he never knew about, okay, what are some of the resources that he can even practice coding tests? Why they give mm -hmm. me this? Not, I've never seen that, I, you know. And uh, it's safe to say that everyone hates coding tests across the well, whole and industry. <laughs> and yeah, there's a couple of memes going around the social, right. you know, the, the recruiting social networks about, hey, I, I'd love to recruit you to a job. Um, uh, here, take 10 hours to do this home study. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's just, it's, I, we, I've been having this conversation, I actually had a conversation late in the last week, and they noticed that, you know, um, like 80% of the people that were being asked to do the coding test weren't doing the coding test. And right. One, act, one, one interesting thing that I would love to see, another bias that, that, that coding tests, it assumes that the person has the time, that right. you know, day job. And, and um, I would love to see if families, you know, you know engineers with, with families, that they go from their day job and they go, they go home to their families if they are unable to do the coding test because they've got the family time. They have right. to do it after the, everyone goes to bed. And by that point, they, they don't want to. So I could see... I could see just just from a standpoint of of the requirements of yeah. a coding test, the time, the time, the process. I can see how that introduces so much bias and so many so many assumptions. Absolutely, it's a it's just a a arbitrary barrier to entry for both job seekers, recruiters, and hiring managers. Right? There's don't get me wrong. There's a pace and place of value, why they're there. They establish like one hiring uh, bar across the organization. Like you imagine if you're a recruiter or staffing professional and you have, you're recruiting for five teams and all the five teams mm -hmm. have different processes, right? Or different bars and they're hiring for something else. Arguably that's allowed, but some, some of the teams will say, no, this guy's too confident, right? And too good 
he doesn't know this and that uh or or you know gives them a, a, their own coding test that's extremely hard has nothing to do with the job just to fill two people out uh, now the reason why assessments exist is just to protect their hiring managers and hiring teams time right from mm -hmm. historically what has been uh you know thousands and thousands of applications how to weed out people who cannot code mm -hmm. quote unquote but it it does weeds out weeds out people who can code that's why when you look at you know senior more experienced technical hiring there's no coding test you just go straight to technical interviews you can ask somebody in this market to take a coding test and you're hiring a senior developer unless you're like amazon and facebook and google right mm -hmm. they'll say no thank you <laughs> yeah so yeah we discovered that pretty quickly that recruiters hate coding tests job seekers hate coding tests engineers hate coding tests because people literally used to be that there's maybe like 30 to 100 questions you know for coding assessments mm -hmm. but people share solutions right so the industry had to evolve and now there's like 5,000 questions, right? Or and question you pick types. And choose. Yeah. Right, and you pick and choose. And now, you know, the barrier to entry for someone to actually learn all these questions and really memorize how to solve them, right? Is it takes months, sometimes even years after you graduate already from a four year degree. It's like if someone asks you, Chris, hey, uh, you know, Chris, take this SAT or GRE, uh, you know, test just to just to get a interview. Um, and people say, No, I don't have time. Right? Yep. Or, or, so. or I've been so far removed, you know, like you were saying earlier, I'm so far removed from the academic rigor required right. for taking a test, or I never learned it. You know, yep. um, you know, my my wife is a, a pediatrician. So she's an MD um, and she's board certified in all these different things. And she wanted to, she's a really good test taker, but she's got to study, you know, study, study, right. study. And she had the time to, to devote to getting her new board certification. And she read all these books and she took all these tests, but she had the time to do it and she had the desire to do it. And right. not everyone has that kind of time to study. Um, and even then, why would I? <laughs> I can go, there are companies that don't do coding assessments and, and what's to stop me from going there? Right. But the thing is, Chris, like being a doctor, being MD, you have to know your stuff, right? And there's a lot of memorization and theory that is applied every day. Encoding what you're being assessed on, like all the hiring managers I talk to, they don't care if people pass the coding test. It's actually like, they don't care if the code compiles. They, all they care about is how people think through the problem, how they problem solve, how they mm -hmm. handle unknowns, right? That's what really matters. And even if someone doesn't pass it, right, uh, then they they want to they want to know. Okay, well, if you had more time, or if you uh, if you had more guidance, how would you improve the code? Have you thought about the repercussions? So mm -hmm. that's kind of the reality of of, uh, of technical hiring assessments. There is a space for them. Most industry doesn't benefit. It creates an arbitrary entry, and really limits the talent pool of candidates that that know how to code. They would do a good job, and and quite frankly, it's a it's a huge, it introduces huge bias going back to our original conversation, right? It disqualifies more underrepresented groups than not. And, and so, you know, and DI, there's, there's a lot of improvements that can be done. And how are you, you know, how are you going to make those, how are you currently making those connections and, and what are you going to do to continue to kind of connect people with that information? Like, how do you, yeah. how do you propose that we, we start changing the process or changing the resetting expectations? Awesome. Uh, yeah, we, we recently, just quite recently, uh, found out a, a, a vehicle, pretty old vehicle, like there's nothing new under the sun, 
right? It's mm -hmm. just uh, different ways of uh, different use cases. So essentially, uh, at Snapbrilia, now we're doing private bounties where companies are in full control, you know, who they invite, who, who participates. So he here's the issue, right? Engineering teams, they are always hiring. They always have work that needs to be done and not enough people to do that do that, not mm -hmm. enough engineers called technical backlog, right? And at the same time, job seekers, right? They need a job. They don't get experience. You know, you, you need experience to to get experience. If you just, nobody gives you the opportunity yeah. to have a job or to work on a project, how can you learn? Right. And on the other side, um, you know, hiring managers also want to know can they do the work or not, right? Arguably, yeah. that's why you need assessments, you know, uh, who can code and who can't. Uh, so we're doing private bounties. Private bounty is when a, when a technical team and a recruiter partners together and post a bounty, a private bounty. It takes a real project that they have, right? And we make sure that it's super secure, it's private, it, you know, like super kosher uh, that the job seekers only have access to files, to, to working files, to complete the, the, pro the project. Uh, companies have, again, full control over who they invite, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, they can put, you know, let's say they need a feature to be built or bug to be fixed, right? And they can put a bounty out there. Uh, maybe a couple hundred bucks, maybe a thousand bucks, maybe 10,000 bucks or $50,000, depending on the level of complexity and the knowledge required to complete this task. And this way, right, instead of you pitching people, hey, hey, Chris, you're, you're amazing, you have awesome resume, right? Your background's great, uh, love, love to talk, talk to you. Can you, uh, can you apply to my job <laughs> like everybody else? Right? Yes. Yeah. You, you can tell them, hey, we have exciting project. Uh, you know, and we invite you to, do, to take part. Um, people who finish it first are the best, can get the bounty, 5,000, 10,000, whatever it is, uh, first place, second place, third place, and have a guarantee interview with the hiring team directly. Right? This is real work. So they're getting paid. So rather than doing just a pure assessment where you know you yep. may or may not get the 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 job, right. you're at least getting compensated for the time. Yep. You know, you do a good job, or you pick a bounty that's a little a little harder or, or easier. Yep. But I can see the, these 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 people coming out of these coding camps. You know, it's these are boot camps. They're taught you know basic skills. Right. They get leveled. Then they get they can go. They can level up. And and but a lot of the best ways to level up would be to actually get the work experience and, and do exactly. the, and the, do it, take a gig, you know, the gig. Exactly. Economy. So you're gigging this. I, I am, I am using an old vehicle for a better purpose, right? Uh, making sure that it's all pimped out and tweaked out to make sure that it can, you know, survive the demands of uh, technical hiring at scale. Right. Uh, and replacing assessments altogether. I, I know that assessments, right, will have its place no matter if there's private bounties or not. Some teams just, mm -hmm. you know, prefer that. I don't have a backlog and so on, right? Uh, my project is super top secret and nothing that, you know, we can share nothing pretty much. Okay, assessments. But if you have stuff that, okay, it is private, but I need to get it done anyway. And, you know, there's limited files that they need access to to create this. So for example, if someone has a simple project of, hey, create me the website, I have the design, make it pixel perfect. Boot campers would devour this. And yeah. you would know who's a, who can, who's, who's good and who's not very quickly, right? It's a competitive environment. Anyways, job search is competitive, right? It's not like everyone can get their job. Straightforward. This is real work that needs to be done. You get paid for it. If you win, even if you don't win second, third place, at least you get guaranteed interviews. And designers right? are already kind of in, you know, like there's, there's 99 designs and, and, and other, and their competitors, they already put in the effort to design a logo 
and may or may not get selected to get and, and get paid. So this is already, but you're doing this in a way that, you know, while a recruiter is still trying to fill the full-time roles, this is an opportunity for the, the companies to get projects done yep. and, and, I, and, try, and try before they buy. Yeah, exactly. Except, you know, the uh, we're making it a little bit different than, than like, uh, you know, Upwork or all those guys where okay. you just gig economy. It's not exactly a gig economy, right? The whole purpose is to hire. You can definitely use it as a gig economy. You just say it's bounty only. There's no jobs, no hiring, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or there's existing like uh, open source bounties that are out there. People just you know, have an open source project and they just build their uh, their dev community around their pro projects once that they can open publicly. But this is something that uh, teams in hyper competitive talent markets like the most engineering software engineer market anything that's experienced even inexperienced right everyone's competing especially for diversity right can use and differentiate themselves from the crowd um, and and get high quality candidates that are both interested to learn and keep learning right as well as to to land a job um, the beauty of this is you know it fosters it, it fills in the gap where you know, people graduate and they can't land a job mm -hmm. right uh, and they need to build experience so let's say you know even if you graduate from boot camp of four-year degree uh, then you have your own projects that you can work on, or you can go to Udemy or Coursera, or any of these online learning solutions mm -hmm. and do the classes. Part of the classes is some, some capstone project or something like that, right? But there's a stigma from the hiring manager side, especially uh, because it's not as rigorous, right? Yeah. It's not used, it's just you build it and put on your resume versus these are, you participate, you win, and it's being used. You got paid for it. The big difference is you got paid, right? Yeah. And even if you didn't get paid, right? Uh, and you, and you do a well, problem, and you do, and you do a good, a good enough job to where they want exactly. to take a chance on you. Get you get your opportunity. Yeah. So you may not be like you know software engineer level three, but you may be software engineer level two, right? Um, yeah, making hiring more objective removing bias from all this because uh, theory is one thing, going to school is one thing, right? But uh, even software engineering, a lot of the schooling that they teach you don't really use day to day. So, so do, you, do you see this, your solution as, you know, giving, giving the entry, uh, giving the entry level folks a, a, a leg up? Is that really kind of where, where they're going to get that, where th that world uh, that w zero to two years, zero to three years, uh, a, a, a fairer shot versus say, the more senior folks. Yeah, I think this this fills in the gap where people don't have opportunities to get experience. Right? Okay, okay. Uh, that that is for sure for entry level, but it can be for any any level. This can be used for any level of hiring. Senior level, it just depends on how much the bounty is right there's million dollar bounties out there right uh that probably teams of experts uh only can <laughs> would work on yeah right uh there's hundred thousand there's five thousand thirty thousand uh, it it depends it all it depends it's, it can be used regardless of the level there's a benefit for you know even internal bounties right hey i have this project it's super secret Right. And yeah. I can only share it internally with people, uh, but I don't have enough engineers. I'm going to put a, you know, 5k reward on it. Uh, help me. And are you, are you seeing, you know, now with everyone working remotely is, you know, more, um, you know, companies getting more and more okay with remote employees. Do you see this as an opportunity for you know, to, 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 to reach out to engineers that may not be able to afford to live in Northern California or could be international or in other under, you know, under other, you know, underserved, you know, cities and, and, and places. 
yeah, absolutely. I see, um, I see a lot of opportunities to partner, right? Mm -hmm. um, where companies can essentially um, build a, you know, a competition or a challenge uh, or, or fund a bounty for that solves a problem. Uh, mm -hmm. Regardless from, of where the people are. Yeah, regardless so that of where they are. Yeah, okay. Right. Uh, could be, I don't know, uh, how, do we, how do we reduce carbon em emission, carbon footprint, right? Um, and uh, people, people can, uh, can pitch their ideas, right? And, and actually mm -hmm. build like mini hackathons almost, and then, uh, and then judge on that. So it can, it can be used for like building community Dev communities can be used across, not just dev, can be can be for design, can be for recruiting, mm -hmm. can be for anything, right? Uh, it's it's a vehicle that we are just making secure, private, right? Yeah. So that companies can utilize it effectively. Um, yeah. But at the same time, though, I I love the mission of of kind of understanding where the you know you kind of already kind of took a look at where the biases are. And, you know, and, and by, you know, the, you know, there, I've got my anecdotal, you know, that families, you know, people with families tend to be excluded from being able to, to finish these coding, these coding tests that yeah. really, you yeah. know, I could put in, I could put it, I mean, I've heard, I've seen some of these coding, coding assessments take 10 to 15 hours. Oh yeah. And that's a, and it's, and, and it's, that's a lot of time. And, uh, and in some cases they're having to do it on the weekends because that's the only time they can get, you know, 10 straight hours. Yeah. I mean, but those kind, but that's where, you know, I think that, that it, it does make it, it does, ex that excludes people. There are people that aren't able to do it. So it's just, a, it's just, I, I really like the fact that you're kind of leveling the playing field there. Cause it's going to make it easier for people to connect with the, that right, that right role, the right company. And then also at the same time, it gives the hiring managers the opportunity to connect with the right talent, not necessarily yep. the right test takers. Exactly. Yep. Okay. Exactly. Right. Better hires, faster hires, get stuff done, right? Uh, senior developers, they can use it to learn new skills as yeah. well, right? Blockchain is a, is a huge rave in the dev community now. Web3 especially, and they want to learn Rust, Solana, Solidity, or Haskell, Plutus, all these new coding languages, right? The, they, the they alphabet just, soup. Yeah, the alphabet exactly. soup of, of, of technology. Right. Yeah. So who wants to take a coding assessment versus, hey, I want to I wanna actually uh, contribute to a real project? And if I'm not like uh, super proficient in, in this, right? Uh, I can perhaps do join as a mentee, mm -hmm. right, of the group, uh, where the senior developer who's the superstar and can do it by himself, and he can sign up as a mentor. So we want a decentralized learning, hands-on learning, right? Where you know America arguably has a shortage of teachers, right? Yeah. Uh, education fundamentally underfunded. Right, depending on who you ask, uh, but teachers are quitting. They're they're part of the great resignation group, right? Like and they're joining. Desert. They're joining my. They're joining my company as sourcers, you know, to learn sourcing, right. and yeah. they're becoming recruiters, you know. Right, right. So they're they're like, you guys are not paying me enough. I have to deal with kids and so on. Right, this is not worth my my mental health and so on. So uh, now, if you have if there is a way for people to get, okay, I want to try how recruiting is. I want to try how blockchain development is, what the project looks like, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, as a, as a mentee, I don't, I, I, I'm not confident to actually finish the project. I don't even want to get paid, but I want to be paid in experience and in learning, right? And as a mentor, you know, there's a lot of work. I don't want to do it all by myself. Right. Yeah. I, I wanna I wanna have ideas. I want someone to to help me out and I'm okay to uh to mentor them throughout this. So um there's a lot of a lot of possibilities, right, with this with this new way of uh of engaging, hiring and finding the the right hires. Like arguably 
another talent leader, um, you know, once told me the number one predictor of, of uh, work performance is work sample, right? Yeah. Uh, it's even higher than like structure interviewing, behavioral interviewing, all of that, like uh, even uh, domain knowledge. On average, right? Like pr product managers is all about domain knowledge, for example. Right. Yeah, but on average, work sample is the strongest, uh, strongest predictor of how someone's gonna do after they start on the job. But the thing is, you if you don't have any experience, right? How are you gonna have a work sample to show? Yeah, no way. You just graduate. So um, just going back to you know what our mission and vision was at the beginning, right? To guarantee a fair opportunity for all. Moving a little bit away from assessments, we have the solution, you know, it's there. You can use assessments if you want to, right? There's always gonna be a space for that, right? But um, but there's just fundamentally a much better way to, to hire, right? Uh, you don't I have agree. to do assessments if someone yeah. can do your work. What's the point? You just, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You need doers. It's one of the reasons why in our training program, we don't use, you know, uh, we, we don't just use made up training samples. We actually use real recruiting issues or real sourcing issues or real research problems awesome. that, and it's actually, we, we've had people coming out of our training program, you know, two, three, four weeks down the road, candidates that they found in training getting hired, That's you know, awesome. they get to ring the yeah. bell. That's right. And it, and even though it's just one person or two people from that training class that might have that experience because they are, you know, they're only reaching out to five or six people in training. But, you know, when you have 20, you know, 15 people going through training and you have them doing real work, talking to real candidates, put introducing them to real clients, just having one or two get a get to ring the bell, the whole class benefited from it. The whole class yeah. has that level up that, hey, they really taught us how to source, how to recruit, because they're doing real live work. And that's where yeah. we, that's where I, I, I really appreciate, um, you know, kind of your mission and, and how you're, how you're, how you're going to, you know, I wish you the best of luck and Thank I really you. wanted Thank to do you, well. And so um, to, just to close up, what's the best way for, for people to connect with you? Um, LinkedIn, email, nanetsnapbilla.com, Twitter, anywhere i'm pretty public person you just you know uh find me uh chris has my phone number uh yeah you know facebook instagram i'm like all over the place i want to thank you so much for taking the time i'm really i really i i, I appreciate your mission and 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 uh wish you all the best and everyone you know reach out to to nin he's a he's a great dude he's also fun to meet up with at the recruiting conferences um yeah. which is where we got to know one another um, so Nen, thank you so much for your time. And, uh, you know, if you need anything, just, just reach out to connect. My pleasure. Thank you, Chris. Great to be here.